What is happening here? Maybe it's a plot point. I don't know. I'm not reading any more of these books. Hey there, I'm Maddie, and today we're talking about book talk, a part of TikTok that's about books. I like to think I'm above the influence when it comes to social media stuff, and I'm definitely not. I got Inception so hard. So my journey with book talk began when the algorithm kept feeding me A Court of Thorns and Roses content. And I'm not talking recommendations either, like, you might like this book. I was getting niche references and inside jokes and fan art for this series when I was barely aware that it even existed. So naturally my dumb smooth brain was like, this is embarrassing, clearly I'm supposed to have read these books. And before I knew it, I'd read all of them. So, touche TikTok, you win. Cars are very loud, I'm sorry if you can hear cars. It kind of seems like book talk has calmed down a little over the last few months though. Maybe that's just me, maybe everyone else is still getting book stuff and the algorithm just decided that I'm on to tile installation videos instead. But either way, I still wanted to talk about BookTok's favorite recommendations. I found a list recently and I've read way more of them than I realized whether I got inceptioned into it by the app or not. So this is actually going to be a two-parter. We're going to talk about the fantasy books and series that TikTok loves today. And then in the next one, we'll do the like non-fantasy books, I guess. So if you want to stay up to date on when that goes live, feel free to hit the subscribe button and hang out with me. Cool. Before I start my thoughts on BookTok's favorite fantasy recommendations, I do want to look deeply into your eyes and remind you that you are allowed to love a book I hate or hate a book I love, and we can still sit together. And with that, I guess I will start my thoughts on BookTok's favorite fantasy recommendations, where the whole saga itself began, for me at least, A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass, also known as Akotar. 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 I've never said that out loud before. Anyway. At a high level, the Akotar series is a fantasy romance about a bunch of hot and powerful fairies. Are you on board so far? Lots of people are. The first book, the titular tome, is A Court of Thorns and Roses. And we open on our favorite thing, a spunky white human girl who has a bow and arrow and can't read. Her name is Feyre, and she uses that bow and arrow to inadvertently kill a fairy, which, based on the treaty between the humans and the fairies, entitles the dead fairy's friend to come and claim Feyre's life. He doesn't kill her, he just sort of takes her to his home in the spring court in the fairylands. There's also a curse involved, part of which has permanently stuck masquerade masks to the faces of all the fairies in the spring court. So the story of that first book is actually a loose Beauty and the Beast retelling, which I kind of kept forgetting as I was reading it, probably because our Belle character is an illiterate archer, and the Beast is a moody dude with a masquerade mask stuck to his face. So it's kind of like if Katniss Everdeen and the Phantom of the Opera were stuck hanging out together on the set of Netflix's Bridgerton show or something. But the rest of the series is very different and doesn't really have anything to do with fairy tale retellings. So if that's not your thing, don't let that dissuade you from trying the series out. And if fairy tale retellings are your thing, prepare to be disappointed, I guess. I don't want to go away a ton about the plot of the series as a whole because like I kind of mentioned, it takes a pretty decent departure after the first book, like it doesn't go where do you think it's gonna go. But I will say, especially in the later books, the plot has a tendency to devolve into an elaborate scavenger hunt. Like, we have to find the orb, and the mirror, and the pieces of this thing, and the book, and the twin of that book, which is a different book. There's just always an object that everybody is searching for. I mean, I get it, and it's a fantasy series, so fantasy series tend to have a lot of, you know, magical objects or special artifacts or things like that, but as I was thinking about this series again, I just happened to notice that a lot of the time it's all about just finding a thing. And then conveniently it gives us an excuse to go to a different setting and meet new hot characters so that we can pair those hot characters up with the existing hot characters we already have because it's Sarah J Mass and it's all magical matchmaking for mega hot fairies. I don't know what this has to do with anything. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that I didn't particularly enjoy the fourth book, A Court of Frost and Starlight, and that's at least partially my fault because I did not have the right expectations going into it. I was reading it on an e-reader, and so I didn't realize that it's a novella, not a novel. I just was going along and thought to myself, this feels like fan fiction, and I don't really get what's going on. And then I looked at the progress bar and I was already like 20-30% of the way done, and I felt like I had barely gotten started. And then I realized what it was. It's basically a Christmas special, but like fairy Christmas. Solstice. Yuletide. Solstice. It's a solstice special. 
It's a very Solstice special. It's basically a bridge between the first trilogy, which follows mostly Feyre, and then the later books, which focus more primarily on other characters. So I just wasn't expecting that, and I kind of hope that it doesn't become a trend in the series to have those little, like, novella things in between stuff. Maybe it already has, and I just haven't been exposed to that a lot. But it's not unforgivable. Like, it's not the worst thing that's ever happened. Overall, I did not hate reading these books. I very much appreciate them for what they are. It was my first experience with what I kind of think of as new adult aesthetic-based fantasy romance, where, you know, all the characters are eternally young and super hot, and all the locations are just, like, very luxurious and beautiful and perfect all the time, and people make collages and mood boards about it. Like, this is what your makeup would look like in the night court, and this is what you would wear in the spring court, and this is what you would wear in the winter court. And that's all fine and good, and there are definitely other series out there going for the same thing and doing it worse. So yeah, I have nothing at all against A Court of Thorns and Roses. Super, super fine. Speaking of aesthetics, I cannot wait to see how bad the inevitable screen adaptation is. I'm pretty sure one of the streaming services has already bought the rights and is making a series. I don't think it's movies, I think it's a series, but even if they get Game of Thrones money for this, the girlies are gonna revolt no matter what. No matter who's in the cast, no matter what it looks like, nobody's gonna be happy and I can't wait to watch. The reaction more so than the series. I probably won't watch the series, we'll see. Last thought on A Court of Thorns and Roses, I get the feeling it's reignited a love of reading for a lot of people who were maybe big readers in their younger years, like the Harry Potter Twilighty crowd, mid-twenties-ish, haven't had a series that you're really excited about in a while. So if that's you, that's really great, and I'm glad that you have figured out that you love reading again, because reading is neat. I'm the first person to have that thought or to say it out loud. You're welcome, everyone. So that is the Court of Noun and Noun series. Let's move on to some other Ampersand books, the Shadow and Bone trilogy and the rest of the books in the Grishaverse, all by Leigh Bardugo. I love these books. The Netflix series is also great if you haven't checked that out yet. I uh, just can't recommend them highly enough. I'll try to rein myself in and not just rant about how great they are for 20 minutes, but you know, bear with me. So the Shadow and Bone trilogy, the Six of Crows duology, and the King of Scars duology all take place in the same universe called the Grishaverse. There are some overlapping characters in all the books throughout, but each set, so the trilogy and the two duologies, follow a different kind of set of main characters. The story across the whole Grishaverse centers on the Grisha, which are people with magical abilities. Shadow and Bone is the first set of books in the Grishaverse, and they primarily take place in Ravka, which is an obviously fictional country that's inspired by Russia. But there are some facets of Ravka that really annoy actual Russians. For example, Grisha in Russian is a nickname for the name Gregory, so Lee Bardugo essentially named her magical people Greg, which I get why that would be irritating if you're Russian, but as an outside American observer, I find it absolutely hilarious, and I'm very glad she did it. Anyway, Shadow and Bone. So Ravka is split into two pieces by the Shadow Fold, which is an area of total darkness, full of monsters. It was created by a dude way back in the day who was trying to practice some dark magic, did an oopsie, and just sort of opened up a chasm in the middle of the country. People still have to cross the shadow fold, though, to get from one side to the other. It's very dangerous and frequently fatal. But could our cool orphan protagonist, Alina, hold the key to destroying the shadow fold once and for all? Tune in next week, or read the book, or don't. Or watch the show, I guess. Six of Crows, the duology, also takes place in the Grishaverse, but the location is primarily Ketterdam, which is a mixture of, like, Amsterdam and Las Vegas and Deadwood, maybe. It's all very seedy and scammy, and there are gangs that run everything. It's, like, it's capitalism and canals, right? It's just very money rules all. It's all about the deal. And our main crew of characters in the Six of Crows duology belong to a gang called the Dregs, which is the coolest possible name for a gang. I can't, it makes me want to start a gang just because of how cool the name the Dregs. Like, oh yeah, I'm in the Dregs. It is so cool. But all of these characters are super unique and interesting. I'm emotionally attached to all of them. One of my favorite sort of ensembles of main characters in a series that I've read before. And the thing about the Six of Crows duology is that they're essentially heist books. Like every character in the crew that we're following has a special set of skills that's gonna help with the heist. And if you told me that I would be interested in a series of books or a couple of books that are primarily magical heists, I would say no, that that is 
incorrect, but oh my gosh, if you're not excited about the concept of magical heist books, still give them a shot because you might surprise yourself. I was definitely surprised. King of Scars is the last duology set in the Grishaverse, and they're still good books, but I don't see them get the same hype that the others do online, and personally they're maybe my least favorite. They're definitely my least favorite out of any of the Grishaverse books. Still great characters, still great stuff. I don't have the same attachment to them that I do to the others. I'm sorry, King of Scars. Don't be mad. Overall, across the Grishaverse, you're gonna get amazing characters, the world building's great, there's really rich relationships, friendships, and romantic relationships. And then there's just interesting sort of self-discovery stuff too. Like what happens if your defining ability or quality is suddenly taken away from you? Or what happens if the primary truth that you have built your life around turns out to be a lie? And how does that affect not only your view of yourself, but your view of your entire culture or your entire worldview? It's very interesting and I think it's written in a way that's accessible for a lot of readers, so that's cool too. I'm also so impressed by how Leigh Bardugo can make world building look so easy. She just does a great job incorporating it into the story, so if she's not info dumping, you're getting to know the setting and the world at the same time as you get to know the characters, at the same time as the plot's developing. And yes, she does take inspiration from, you know, real life cultures, obviously. Sorry, Russia. But she doesn't throw it at you, she lets you kind of discover on your own, and that is such an underrated thing to find in the series. Speaking of info dumping, let's talk about our last ampersand-based fantasy series from Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Jennifer L. Armentrout, if by some horrible turn of fate you come across this video someday, I respect that you have cranked these books out, you have secured the bag, and that is something to be proud of. There are some people who absolutely love your books, and I don't. I don't. And I feel bad that I don't, but I just really, I don't like them. I don't, I don't like the books. I'm so sorry. I'm just going to read you the first bit of the official synopsis because I have no idea how to go about putting it in my own words and I choose not to take on the emotional labor of trying. So here we go. Chosen from birth to usher in a new era, Poppy's life has never been her own. The life of the maiden, capital M, is solitary, never to be touched, never to be looked upon, never to be spoken to, never to experience pleasure. Waiting for the day of her ascension, capital A, she would rather be with the guards fighting back the evil that took her family than preparing to be found worthy by the gods. But the choice has never been hers. What is the maiden with a capital M? No one really knows. What is ascension with a capital A? No one really knows. And that sums up how I feel about this series as a whole, for the most part. From the very beginning of From Blood and Ash, from the moment we open on our protagonist in a saloon for some reason, I was annoyed and confused and frustrated by the plot, the characters, the dialogue, the world building, the lore, the setting, the writing style, just everything. Everything was, I was not having a good time at all. And as I was reading that first one, I started taking notes on all the little things that were bothering me because I was going to pick my sister up from the airport later and I wanted to have my critiques organized so I could rant to her about them instead of asking her how her trip was. And I was mostly concerned about the names because wow, wow. Choices were made with the names, decisions were reached. I just... <sighs> if you still want to read the From Blood and Ash series, even after hearing me talk for the last few minutes, skip ahead from here because we're gonna go off-roading into spoiler territory because I have to talk about the names. So just skedaddle for now, come back later. Okay, let's start with our main character. Her name is Penelope. Penelope, no, Penelope. She also goes by Poppy. Is it the worst? It's not the worst. Is it great? It's not the worst. Moving on, we've got two queens. Eloana and Iliana. They're both pretty close to being the same name, and they also feel like sort of the default name of a queen in a fantasy series. I have no information to back that up. It's just if someone was like, what's the name of the queen in a fantasy series? I would be like, Iliana, Iliana, Eliana, something like that, you know? If you can, if you can back me up, Put it in the comments, because I know that it, know that it gets used, or some, some variation on that gets used a lot. 
And another thing that's weird about them being so similar is that one of them's using a fake name. It's like she just looked over and was like, what's that queen's name? Okay, I'll change it a little bit and no one will notice. Like, if you're gonna use a fake name, go all out. Continuing in the vein of things that sound the same, there's a location called Elysium Peaks. E-L-Y-S-I-U-M, Elysium. Across the map, there's another location called Elysium. I-L-I-S-E-E-U-M. How would you say those two things differently? Like, has anyone listened to the audiobook? Did they say those things the same? I also don't even know if they're both mentioned necessarily in the book. I just happened to look at the map and was like, what is happening here? Maybe it's a plot point. I don't know. I'm not reading any more of these books. And then we're back to fake names again. The love interest fake name is Hawk Flynn. Yes, that is the name that they would give a cool guy with a skateboard in a Disney Channel original movie, but that's not the part of this that bothers me. What bothers me is that he chose the first name Hawk because his real middle name is Hawkthrone. Not Hawthorne. Hawkthrone. Bird chair. What? And the last one. The main character's token black friend is named Tawny Lion. Tawny means brown, and lion is an African animal. That's gonna help us as the reader remember that she's black. I assume the author chose Tawny Lion because her editor vetoed Mahogany Hyena and Burnt Sienna Meerkat. Choices. Decisions. What else is there? What, what else is there to say about this series? Honestly, a ton. I could talk about this for hours, but I'm gonna try to rein in it. So basically, when I see people talk about For Blood and Ash, they're not talking about the world or the plot or what might happen next. It's only about the main couple, and I think they're idiots. So I don't, I'm not, I don't like the books. And also, the like enemies to lovers, will they, won't they sort of thing is basically figured out and smoothed out by the end of the first book. Subsequent books just give us more world building crap to keep track of and it's just info dumping. We've got vampires, werewolves, shapeshifters, which I think are different than the werewolves but might not be. There's a different kind of other vampire also that's like a zombie vampire called a craven. We've got gods, we've got demigods, we've got the Maiden, we've got a bunch of fake names and some, and nothing's happening with those. It's just, there's more, like that's not plot. That's, it, this could be a textbook and it would probably be easier to understand and equally as interesting as it is. Oh, another name thing, the blood forest. The blood forest. I wonder what happens in the blood forest. I wonder if people have fun in the blood forest. No, ah, the only things that happen are Cass and Poppy hook up, which, okay, good for them. And then the characters are going from one forgettable location to another forgettable location so that Poppy can ask questions and someone can answer her questions. It's just like a Q&A to help the reader figure out what the hell has happened over the last like couple of years. Like nothing is currently happening. They're just talking about stuff that happened before and Poppy's there like, wow, really? It is a landfill of info dumping with two people hooking up on top of it. It is TikTok's favorite tropes in a trench coat. It feels like the author is making it up as she goes. And I just don't like it. And I'm sorry, I feel like an a-hole. I should also explain why did I read all three books if I clearly was not enjoying myself. I did not expect to dislike the first one as much as I did. And I also don't like DNFing or like stopping books once I've started them. For the most part, I try to muscle through. And with this one, I muscled through specifically because I had seen so many people who loved this series so much. And I was like, it's gotta get a little better, right? Because I even had real life acquaintances on Goodreads who were like, this series is everything. I love it. I can't wait for the third one to come out. It's gonna be great. So I was like, it's gotta get better or people would not be so excited about it. I wonder if we just need to get some of the crap out of the way in the first book and then it's gonna get better from there. It it didn't. It didn't get any better. If anything, it's gotten significantly worse. But I still read the third one because I had some assumption that it was a trilogy. I don't know where I got that. Once again, I don't pay attention. We heard how I dealt with a novella on an e-reader. But I was like, I might as well see it through. I'm two books in. Let's just see how they wrap it up because I can't imagine how they're going to do it. I get halfway through the third book and I'm like, there's no way this is the last book because nothing has happened. Nothing has happened this whole time and they keep just introducing new weird stuff for me to try to keep track of. I look it up. 
It's gonna be six books long. The series is gonna have six books. How? It's already watered down or like fillered. It's both watered down and overstuffed somehow. I cannot imagine how this series is gonna be six books long. The romance story's over. Or like, not over, romance never dies. But the romance is more or less buttoned up because they're married and stuff. So I don't know what's gonna happen for the, like, I cannot imagine how she's gonna keep this up. I have no idea. Someone let me know how it goes because I'm done. If you Venmo me $200, I'll maybe read the fourth one. Okay, I'll calm down now. Let's end on a standalone TikTok fantasy favorite with a little bit of a different flavor. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by B.E. Schwab. So we didn't really get our bell in the Court of Ferns and Roses Beauty and the Beast retelling, but we kind of get her here. Adeline LaRue is an 18th century French girl who is not satisfied with her provincial life. And while the book doesn't specify that she goes around singing a song about how small-minded her neighbors are every morning, I think you and I can go ahead and imagine that for ourselves. Anyway, our premise. Addie isn't like the other girls. She doesn't want to stick to the status quo and settle down and get married, so she disobeys the one explicit direction she's given by her elderly neighbor slash spirit guide, and she makes a deal with the darkness wherein she can be independent and live her own life and be young forever with the catch that no one will remember her. Until one day, someone does. And it's not just that the people from her life now don't remember her after she makes this deal. Like, obviously, when she goes home to her parents, they're like, who are you? But anytime she meets anyone going ahead into the rest of her life, like, if she introduces herself to you and then you go to the bathroom and come back out, you won't remember her anymore. Basically, like, she could create zero connections. She could have zero impact on the world. And it took me a long time to get through this book. And I think part of it was because the concept is profoundly sad to think about for too long. Like, not to get all academic, but there have been many studies that show our relationships to other people have the biggest impact on our happiness and well-being of basically any factor in life, right? Like, Harvard studied it for decades and came away with the conclusion that, yeah, to be happy, you have to have those relationships. You have to have connections to other people. So it even just, I know it's a book and I know it's a fantasy book, but just to think about someone having to deal with that for not just decades, but like hundreds of years is just a mega bummer. Ignoring the hopelessness and emptiness of years and years alone, making no impact on the world and creating no personal connections with other people, the concept is interesting to think about. To be sort of an anonymous person who is forever young and able to kind of go wherever within, you know, her own abilities to figure out how to do that when no one can remember her and she doesn't have any material possessions. But the book touches on different sort of cultural moments, like Addie is in Europe for World War II, and there's some mention of that, in New Orleans for different stuff. So it has little mentions, but it's definitely not the main focus of the book, and sometimes I wished it was. <laughs> like, the story's still great, and there's beautiful, beautiful writing. I listened to it as an audiobook, and I almost wish I had read it on my e-reader or had a physical copy that I could highlight or underline, because there are just some gorgeous descriptions. The characters were pretty well developed. There's a little naivete, a little bit of pretentiousness, a little bit of privilege, but I mean, people do be like that, so what can you do? They're characters. I also might have been reading a little bit more of that naivete into the book than there actually was. I was fresh off reading The Beekeeper of Aleppo, which is about Syrian refugees, and I think it was kind of hard for me to switch gears into the more internal conflicts of Addie LaRue versus the like Syrian refugee conflict, which is just a very different situation. And I don't mean to say that you can only struggle with mental health and PTSD and that kind of stuff if you're a Syrian refugee, obviously not. It's just, I think it colored my perception a little bit moving from that to this and made me like, are you guys just whiny or do you have actual problems? Characters had problems. I just, I definitely would have read it differently if I hadn't just read about people like crossing the Mediterranean on a small inflatable boat. That's all. Overall, I did enjoy reading slash listening to this book. I'm sure the ending is controversial, but I think it's about as satisfying as it could be, all things considered. So... And that basically covers my thoughts on some of TikTok's favorite fantasy book recommendations. Thank you so much for hanging out. This is my first YouTube video, and I really appreciate it if you have made it all the way to the end here. 
just means a lot. I am really excited to get more into all of this and to keep sharing my thoughts on some of my favorite books and least favorite books, I guess. If there's other types of videos that you would like to see, feel free to put them in the comments. If you want to bully me off the platform, the comments are also a great place for that. If you want to keep up with whatever I post next, which will probably be part two of the book talk series with the non-fantasy recommendations, hit the subscribe, turn on notifications. That's the thing that people say. Um, but either way, yeah, thanks for your time and I will see you in the next one. And stay hydrated and don't talk to anyone you don't feel like talking to. See ya. This is hard.